Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Monday. Morning, Kay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Ryan. How are you? Yeah, all good, mate. You? How was Father's Day weekend? Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Day morning, out lads. Family. Morning, Stel. Hey, guys. Yeah, very nice. I had uh, my father as well on Saturday, uh, just before he flew back out to Spain. So, yeah, we had a nice lunch and stuff. You, yourself? Yeah, that was uh, perfect. Yeah, I had the daughter over. Bit of a uh, partial family time, always uh, nice to have. That was great. Yeah, how about you, Stel? I was on the beach, so I'm not going to elaborate any further. <laughs> <laughs> We're when are you not on the beach? <laughs> yeah, on, on Tuesdays, I'm not on the beach. They are from they are from the beach Tuesdays. Yeah, I'll get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right, well, let's get into it. We're going to have a, a little bit of a different uh, flow to the show today. Let's call it that. Um, we'll run over just a couple of pieces of news and then look at a couple of quick look at the markets. Um but what I'm going to do is just get it as it's a quiet day due to the, the US holiday and, and we had a big week last week. Things tend to quieten down the week after. Just going to have a look at some of the market myths and lies that we get told and traders get told. And just going to address some of those and, and give some advice there as well. Uh, so let's kick off with some of the news. We'll go to China first. Um, they left their uh, loan prime rates unchanged overnight. There wasn't any real expectations for them to change these rates. Um, so it was a bit of a confirmation on that. Uh, the loan prime rates is, is one of the areas that they can they can look to do easing without doing big rate cut easing, if you know what I mean. So they've got their main rates and, and the uh, reserve requirement ratio rates. Those are the sort of big ones that they, they can cut if they want to go full on easing. They have looked to change these smaller rates, loan rates, uh, NPRs, LPRs, that sort of thing, um, sort of secondary easing moves, but they didn't do anything there. Um, COVID testing in Shanghai, they've been doing these, this blitz testing in Shanghai, and it's pretty much showing things are largely contained. So the, the threat of lockdowns or further lockdowns, increased lockdowns has diminished a bit from that. So although we're not seeing that too much reflected in, in the risk picture, Overall, um, it is an ongoing thing that we need to keep an eye on and things are uh, looking a bit more contained over there. Now, the big news from Europe over the weekend was Macron failing to get his majority. He needed 289 seats to get that full majority. He only got 245. So while he's still the largest party, he's going to need uh, to go into another coalition Um I'm not sure what the metrics are there right now, but it's probably one of these things that they're going to have to then go around the other parties, whether he stays in the with some of the other parties he's already with. Um, it's called the the Ensemble Group or something like that. So no real big move in the, the Euro when that happened last night. It was off about 16 pips. Uh, recovered this morning. I was, it was one of those <clears throat> risk events that uh, you potentially need to see how Europe reacts to it. Um, as you can see, taking it all in its stride, um, so no real risk there. Um, but we will need to keep an eye on how that develops, uh, just to make sure that the government can function properly. Uh, Moving over to Japan, um, nothing big out of there overnight. There was a, a poll run by the Nikkei uh, over the weekend that showed that 46% of people think the BOJ should stop their excessive easing policy. Um, I think it was 36% said they should continue with the, the rest uh, undecided. Um, I don't know what the prior numbers is, or on any prior poll was. So I don't know if that's an increase or a decrease. Uh, but again, it's just something to keep an eye on if dissent amongst the population to, to the Bank of Japan is steadily building. Obviously, we had all that hoo-ha with Kuroda saying uh, he was misunderstood when he said that... Uh, population could withstand higher prices that caused a bit of a fuss um, that theme seems to still be bubbling uh, it may put some pressure on the Bank of Japan uh, we actually had uh, Kuroda and Kashida having another little chin wag uh, today with concerns expressed about the FX level um, again it's just this bubbling pot of talk about 
FX? Um, is it getting to levels where they are going to be seriously concerned? Um, are we creeping there? A lot of the market trying to put a number on that. Is it 135? Well, we've already gone through 135. Is it now 140? Is it 145? Is it 150? Um, so lots of speculation there about, you know, where is the, the real pressure level for the Bank of Japan and obviously for the government? Um, but again, until we start getting bigger volatility, higher volatility, um, and as we mentioned time and time again, comments about the speculative nature of, of some of these moves, um, it's just in a, a wait and see mode about that and uh, how they're going to talk about it. Um, I know you covered some of the, the, the comments, uh, Kay. Do you see any real change there from uh, these two bods, Karuda and uh, Kashida? Uh, <clears throat> no, I think the Karuda understood that he has to do his little bit uh, to keep the market on, the, on its toes um, because usually they don't comment about uh, the currency. But I, it looks as if, we, uh, as we said also last week, there's a bit of pressure um uh, mounting there um yeah people are not really not really happy about it but for the time being i i, I think they hope that uh the the energy will come off a little bit uh it did crude did come off uh, at the end of last week uh, quite uh, quite heavily um but it's already stabilizing uh, well uh, well above 100 uh, the first level should be around 105 or so for for crude, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, but as long as those things don't really come off with crude uh, below and staying below 100 bucks, and then the rest of the energy uh, uh, coming off as well, they they will still uh, uh, have a problem. And, and and as well with the Bank of Japan, uh, not not moving an inch, uh, they they putting themselves pressure on the pressure on the on on the end. So it's a bit uh, do what I say, don't don't look at what I do, you know. Um, but to come back, like a, a quick word about um, those French elections. Uh, Mac uh, Macron is really in a pickle there because the second largest, um, the noobs, the second largest uh, uh, party now is uh, if he, he can't go in ship with them because they are totally opposite uh, of, of what his policy is. And um, and the, the next party, the next party is uh, is Le Pen's party, and, it, and I really think he has a he has an issue there. I'm I'm a tad surprised that it doesn't weigh a bit more on the euro because Macron, one of one of the guys behind the big uh, European ID, uh, lost just lost his ma his majority. So I'm a little surprised that the the euro is uh, is shrugging it off so easily. Um, is the market thinking that he will find coalition parties, but uh, they, the rest is really small. I mean, once we start to look at the at the fourth largest one, which possibly could go with him, the, the Republica, I think they they only have like four or five percent left or so. Um, it, it's it's uh, he's he's in uh, he's in trouble, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's it's he only sort of needs forty what forty four seats to get yeah, that yeah. majority. Um, so he can, you know, go into coalition with some of the smaller parties without having to touch uh, the Pens party. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was surprised by the reaction as well that, that we didn't see a bigger reaction in the Euro, but you know, didn't see much in the first round. Um, so it looks like the market isn't paying that much attention to it at the moment. So, but I think he's saying we need, we definitely need to, to keep an eye on. Mm. Um, definitely. Um, but if he only chooses. If he only chooses Les Républicains, he's, he's going to have to lead with a minority government. Uh, and that's never good, right? Because then those those extreme left ones, they and, and the and the extreme right will have a will have a, a possibly blocking uh, uh, blocking numbers for, for anything that he wants to do. But okay, maybe yeah. we should move on and see how that develops over time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Stel, what do you make of the, the drop in oil? Are you are you believe in these recession worries? Uh, uh, I mean, given given the incredible rise that we had, we we've been saying there's going to be some kind of pullback. I still think it's by the dip mode in oil. Hold on a second. Give me ten seconds. Hold on. Yep. Go ahead, mate. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I still think by the dip in oil, as I've said before, the oil price will have an effect on the economy and spending, but uh, we're not there yet. So I, I think it's by the dip. I be I was looking at the charts um, 
uh, to find a decent level. Let me have another look. Uh, we are actually at the 200 DMA, right? Uh, sorry, not the 50 DMA. So, and that's where we found. Yeah. So, um, I think it's not a bad place around here um, to be trying a, uh, you know, to buy the dip. But you know, my my um, bias has not changed. It's still buy the dip in in oil, sell the rally in risk. I know it doesn't make sense to say those two things together. They usually move together, yeah. but at the moment, that's that's my view. And and it was a a pretty um, pretty uh, strong move lower on Friday and, and and Thursday, right? So, yeah, definitely. I think I think we need a bit of caution because it's, it's you know it's definitely not bouncing as quick. Uh, maybe we need to see the the US come back into the fray. Obviously, with the, the holiday today, that may be putting a little yes. bit of a dampener on on what the price may do. But uh, definitely the one to watch if if we don't get a bounce, um, a strong enough bounce, you know, at least a back above sort of you know one ten one twelve. It might be looking a bit iffy. Obviously, that big drop in oil isn't going to filter through to uh, our car prices, our pump prices as quickly. You can be sure of that. Still paying. <laughs> Does it ever for filter through? I've never <laughs> yeah, seen car yeah. fuel prices go down. <laughs> yeah, never, never. But uh, anyway, one to keep an eye on it again. And obviously, the we've seen the knock on there. Obviously, in uh, dollar CAD. Where's it gone? There we go. You know, big move down. You know, you could say that's a very strong sign of another double top up there um, into that 130s. Uh, I know K was riding this one short from Friday. Uh, I finished early on Friday, so I missed it altogether. Um, let's see what it does in this zone that I've been pointing out for a while, that's sort of 129 up to 131. Could be a big break zone or hold zone, but looking like a strong double top at the moment. And obviously oil dumping uh, looks looks the opposite of what you do use expect you expect dollar cad to go up when i was dumping off um that just shows how the correlations have, have changed slightly um you hoping to hold this your short further k um i'm going to see how uh, how it goes around if you get down to the 129 and a half fish um but i also added because there's an interesting euro canada as well uh range going on it, it, it held really really strongly on the 134 the other day um, it's, it's a massive. And now we are looking at the other side. I've got this, uh, yeah, you've got it there as well, the 137.60. Uh, it already looks a tad off at around 137. Um, I'm not a big Euro believer, so I'm, I'm trying a little short there as well, but I'm keeping it uh, small. Um, the dollar cat is, is more like, yeah, play this double top, waited for it to happen, went short around 130 and a half, already cut a few. It's, I'm, I'm still in uh, um, in, in a re relatively short term mode on on most of uh, most of the stuff with a kind of a kind of a bias. As long as gold doesn't uh, fall out of bed, as long as the Canadian data kind of hold up, hold up, I'm uh, I'm happy uh, uh, Canada deep buyer, but uh, all the while taking profits relatively uh, quickly. So. But my bias is still there, and uh, as long as um, you you just showed 137.60 caps on the euro cad, I, I might be trying to trade that from uh, from the short end as well. And then if we if we see uh, drops take uh, start to take profit uh, middle of the range, and then uh, see see how we go from how we go from there. Yeah, lovely. Um, yeah, that, that can be the, the way to do it. You know, when you, when you when we find that we have these these big weekly events or these big fundamental events, central bank events, um, the market does all its pricing, repricing. As we said, Friday was probably a big repricing day for everything that, that went on the during the week. And um, now we go back to looking at the ranges. And as, as Kay says, you know, something like EuroCAD, you know, where you've got a definitive range, that's what you look to trade, you know. And if they break, then you either go with the break or, or you sit back and wait for the next levels to develop and where the next range is going to come in. Um, and that's what you want to do, you know, slice and dice, get your sniper rifle out and just uh, see what happens. Um, right, I'm going to look quickly at something that I, I looked at overnight. <clears throat> that I do on a Sunday, I put together the options for the week. Um, now this is this is mainly for, for Forex Analytics subscribers. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to show this too often anymore because, you know, as I say, you know, the subscribers pay for this service. So if you want to get this service, obviously, feel free to join the uh, Forex Analytics platform. 
uh, you'll get all this information included in the full subscription. If you want to do so, quick plug, you can do so if you look at this link on the forexflow.live uh, traders platform tab. Um, you can have a look there what we offer and also take a discount, exclusive discount, 20% off the subscription for the lifetime of your subscription. Uh, but anyway, back to, to looking at the options. We've been having some, some fairly quiet weeks and this week it's just dropped off a cliff. Um, I mean, this is the expiry due this week for dollar yen. Um, the biggest is 910,000 on Thursday. But you can see there is absolutely nothing. Um, the biggest strike this week is just over uh, 1 billion at 132. Um, I mean, I've, I see busier periods in that time between Christmas and New Year, you know, when the market's a little bit dead. I, we, get, we get more option expiries during those periods than I've seen here this week. Um, and it's pretty much reflected uh, across the board, even in uh, euro dollar, you know, just over 1.3 billion. Um, at 105, very, very quiet. Um, big expiry, 803 million. I'm not sure what's what's making it so quiet in the options of late. This is, has been a trend that's been happening for a while. It could be that we've just moved into to price areas, particularly in dollar yen, <clears throat> that haven't been, um, the market didn't think we'd get to. You know, it has been a big, strong move up in, in dollar yen, um, which has left the, the option markets chasing a bit. But even so, just to get these these low levels of, of expiries, um, it's I won't call it concerning, but it just it, it's showing a lack of action, um, which in itself can can tell a story. Kay, what do you what do you make of it? You know, these options really really getting less and less. Yeah, I was um, I actually gave gave that a thought as well. The end of last week, and um, what I can see about it is that well, first of all. The, the vols uh, over the past uh, weeks have exploded, right? So that already makes it more expensive to put either directional or protective trades on for those who are uh, uh, buying options. And for those selling it, there is, uh, it, when the option volatilities are so high, it, it, it may seem attractive to start to sell options, but then looking at the, at the actual volatility, you can get taken out uh, relatively easy. So I think that's one one part of it. The other part of it is that since um, this whole move started, we can see the, the risk market coming back a little bit. You, you don't see it in FX prices, but you see it in the equity markets. You see the oil is getting a little jittery, the the, the uh, energy, the, the base, uh, the base uh, uh, commodities are, uh, are getting volatile. And I also think the the, the people are um, a bit reluctant to to pay extra money to have FX options on when the rest of the of the asset classes are uh, are volatile because they usually you, we we will see a lot more options uh, in the in the FX when when the market is either positive or um, relatively quiet. Um, or at least uh, a, a little volatility, but nothing out of whack, you know. Um, so I, I think those those are the main reasons why uh, we're seeing so little. And I also think that um, because in in the yen, for instance, in the yen especially, we we have to know that a lot the the Japanese corporates are are responsible for a lot of the options. So banks and people who are in the know of of how they trade, they can. Um, trade the option market as well based on those ones. But since the since the dollar yen or the yen really weakened really rapidly, I think there is less corporate interest uh, uh, in the markets as well, less asset management uh, interest in the market as well. So all the others who uh, who are trading in the slipstream of those, they they have less uh, less clues as well. And and I do think that that is partially res uh, responsible for the for the lack of uh, options that we are seeing now. Do you also think it's perhaps, you know, some of the big Japanese whales, you know, like the, the GPIF, which if, if people don't know, is is the huge pension companies um, and insurance companies who who really, you know, they are, in essence, a lot of the Japanese market. Um, you know, they, they were saying going into this fiscal year that they were going to go a lot of stuff unhedged. Yeah, that as well. That, that as well, because well, typically they will put hedges in, in place or protection in place, but it would be rather to the downside of the of the dollar yen or the yen pairs because they 
per definition, when okay, they have like a a, a big part in JGBs and in uh, and in local markets, but they have increasingly um, invested uh, outside of Japan over the past years. Because if we recall, a couple of years ago, they uh, even uh, spread their mandates out. Uh, BlackRock, uh, again, BlackRock is is actually handling a part of uh, uh, GPIF's money. And so they have less the need for doing uh, uh, setting up big protection uh, hedges, and as well they would be rather to the downside. So um, since they are Japan Japan based, and they they want to protect uh, uh, against um, rapid uh, drops in uh, in foreign investments. So all of that explains, and, and and we are in ranges where we haven't been, as you were rightly saying, for a long time. Usually. Uh, the, all those hedges, and they would be 100 to 110 and below, but we are trading 135. So they probably don't need too much uh, protection right now, unless um, the risk markets really start to go down rapidly, like uh, S&P and, uh, and, and uh, well, they do a lot of individual stocks as well, but they probably will have had uh, a little scare already on their bonds as well. Um, but then their uh, their uh, foreign um, what should I say foreign profits or returns? Let's put it that way. Not not necessarily profits, but returns. They will uh, they 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 now uh, since the yen has weakened so much have uh, have gone up dramatically. Um, so I think they they have less. Uh, they are less in the market themselves. So and and that should also explain uh, a part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so before I get into uh, the, the second part of, of the show, I want to delve into just have a, a quick look around the pricing, uh, see what's going on in markets. Um, speaking of dollar yen, again, we've had a, an attempt up to the, the recent highs, you know, that uh, 135.50s area. Not really getting as far as that, so the market shifted back down again, back under 135. Again, as I've been saying, looking to see what range develops here. We, we're getting strongest signs that we've got a, a potential top or top area coming into play now it's a little bit messy um you know what you want to see is is a structure like that with with pretty solid tops but <clears throat> you know then we break a a fresh high come back down then we have another fresh high uh then we have a move south come back up can't quite get as high um so it's becoming another bit of an area um above 135 to, to 135 50 um call it 50 60 whatever you want to do um so signs over top and it just looks like the 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 downside needs a bit of development as, as to what's going to happen down here um is 133 going to become a, a support level again um you know we had the break obviously some big events going on there the fomc and and whatnot uh, but is it going to become another big level or are we going to see something coming up a bit higher maybe around the the 133 and a half mark um so just on that it's going to be a Again, a work in progress just to see what develops there. Take your cues from what happens up here. If we, if we get up here and we can't hit those highs again or we get close and we just can't get above, that gives you a bit more conviction that we've got a potential top in place. And as Kay said this morning, and as we're doing, you just look to intraday, just trade the ranges. Um, you don't have to go big on these sort of things. Um, just play the levels. Levels are level until it's not. Um, and look at what develops on the other side, see where the support starts coming in. Um, Euro sterling quickly is, is one I want to have a quick look at. You know, again, here we are, have a big level at 86. We had the break. We've come back down below it. Then it held as resistance again. Now it's just getting a little bit messy, you know, holding as resistance. Little break above, holding support. You know, we're probably going to call it down 85, 90, 86. Um, so it's just the price is just deciding what it wants to do around this 86 handle at the moment. Does it want to stay above? Does it want to break back below? Going a bit wider on this, um, I think now we've had the ECB out of the way, we, we're potentially going to see a bit of uh, treading water going on here. So again, look to, towards the ranges, you know, 85, 84, 80 is the zone of support at the moment. Top side, again, looking a little bit not as clean. I'm going to be looking at this this zone again, then up towards these highs and this fib level. That was a, a pretty strong top up there. Um, had, a, had two cracks of it, couldn't break it. And obviously the move down speaks for itself. So again, I expect, you know, into 87, into these highs to be to be a bit solid again, 
depending obviously on, on what the driver is. So for this one, looking at that 85, 84, 80, up to that 86, 50, 70 area um, as, a, as an intraday or shorter term range, going on the wider, down into the low 84s, up to those 87s again, might be the range that we, we stick in unless we get any big news either from the UK, more shit hitting the fan there, or something changes from, from the ECB. We have got this bubbling fragmentation tool stuff going on. Uh, we've, we've spoken about it before. Is it going to be positive? It's probably going to be positive in, in terms of there's going to be another support tool there to stop things if, if anything untoward happens. But it is going to be another emergency tool. Um, but really, you know, the longer it goes on and the more the ECB members come waffling out about it, the market is going to get over it. Um, it's going to get bored of the headlines. It's going to be, well, we know it's coming. Just tell us when it's here and we'll react then. Um, so I think the the more it gets spoken about until we get the actual details, the less the market is, is going to trade it. So I'm not expecting any big shocks when they do finally announce it, unless it's got some details in there that we don't know about that are hugely supportive towards the euro. Um, okay, still, you got any uh, thing you want to talk about price wise? Any markets before we we move on? Mm, not really. Uh, a bit cryptos is trying to rally, trying to get off the lows. Excuse me, uh, girls. Shh, thank you. Sorry, I have two two kids here. We're quite loud. Um, cryptos is trying to <laughs> they're trying to bounce, and uh, I'm seeing on Twitter already people showing their hundred k charts again. For Bitcoin, I still think risk is, should be uh, risk should be sold on rallies, but not much is moving today, so I don't really have anything to say. No, it's a bit, it's a bit quiet. So uh, we'll have a look. Yeah. Kay, you got anything uh, on the agenda? No, I was actually looking. <laughs> it's not even uh, of use to put the metals on because they are still firmly in their ranges. Uh, silver between twenty one and twenty two, with this twenty one forty in between. Uh, gold, same stuff. Uh, need to break above 55 again on the on the uh, underside. Uh, uh, 38 and 30, 28. Uh, it, it, it's all firmly within ranges right now, and I, I think we are, as as already said a couple of times, but data will actually start to drive the market again, in my opinion. So, uh, which is a welcome change. Uh, we we we. We will be able to trade data again. That's uh, that's what I'm I'm really thinking. <laughs> oh, the one one last one that you may be uh, talking about, and and you spoke about it already a little before, Ryan, was this dollar China because I know that you're long in in, in that, and uh, it, it interestingly held your rain your uh, support zone again, uh, despite uh, PBOC not doing anything. Uh, so we had the reaction on the back of it uh, going down, but it does hold the 660, 666.67, yeah, on the dollar China. I think that's interesting. On the other side, I have a 671 and a half in there, which lies quite nicely in between the the, the support zone and the 675, 78 zone, which is uh, which is decent resistance. So um, it's it. We are building, trying to build a range there as well, in my opinion. And uh, yeah. I'm still with you. I'd like to buy the, the, the dip. I haven't done it so far. Um, but um, it's interesting that it held after the PBOC. Yeah, I've, I've actually got a, a little bid into uh, add back at uh, 80 and, and 50. Yeah. Uh, 66.6 is 80 and 50, um, just while that level plays out, um, just to add back in a bit of what I cut. Not not a big position because I, I was looking to build down to that 66 handle, uh, the devil's number there, 666. Um, but yeah, I, I was a bit surprised at the, the reaction. I don't know if that came on the back of the uh, PBOC meeting. Maybe there was a, a few more expectations for a rate move there than, than the market actually got. Um, so yeah, a little bit of change, but it is it is sort of defined as a level. I don't want to see it tested too many times, to be honest, because the you know as one of my trading theories is that the the more times the level is tested, the the greater the chance increases of a break, and the the harder the break may be. But <clears throat> yeah, definitely looking to to play the range into that six seventy nine, six eighty area there as well. Um, just quick looking at the data, we've got the I think we've got some flash PMIs this week. Um, got UK CPI. Let me show you this calendar. 
just so you can have a look. This is just something I, I look at now and again. It gives me a good weekly view. <clears throat> uh, Canada retail sales tomorrow. Uh, more US housing data, existing home sales. Wednesday, UK CPI, PPI, uh, MBA, Canada CPI. Um, Eurozone consumer confidence. Uh, that's always a fun number to watch. It's only been uh, positive, I think, three times in its entire history. Um, and then we get into to PMI day um, on Thursday. Um, so we start to see, we've seen the, take the US, we've seen the, the Empire, the Philly Fed, both Shane, uh, some some poor numbers, if you like. So we'll see if that's continued into, into the PMI sector and see how Europe uh, is doing over that and the UK doing over that. Uh, Friday, UK retail sales. Uh, which is going to be where we're doing. going to be for May, I believe. Um, I don't know if they're going to reflect the Jubilee in those numbers um, because that should be a bit of a, a, a boost for spending. Um, but as that came uh, the June weekend, it may not reflect those. But it could, we could see some pre-Jubilee uh, spending in there, uh, which might give it a bit of a, a false bounce. Um, more housing data, new home sales and consumer sentiment, <clears throat> which, as we now know, consumer sentiment and particularly inflation expectations are a big part of the Fed's thinking that Powell, you know, Powell brought that up at the FOMC last week. So the market is going to be looking at those and things like the Michigan consumer sentiment, the inflation expectations, they're going to be a, a bigger part of everything. But until, overall, not a hugely big data week. Um, but a few bits and pieces to keep us interested there. Um, so, right, okay, well, let's move on a bit now. Um, um, Ryan, what I wanted to talk... Yeah, go on, mate. Um, we do have Nagana talking this afternoon, right? Um, she does... She gives the introductory statement at the hearing before the Committee on, on Economic and Monetary Affairs of the European Parliament. Um, it, it should be, uh, because usually she just repeats the statement of the ECB when she does introductory uh, speeches for those uh, committees. Um, the only thing is uh, what where she could move, uh, potentially the markets, uh, as Rick was asking, is uh, if she would change just the tone uh, slightly to leave a door open for uh, bigger than 25 uh, BPs uh, move in, uh, in July. So because as, as of now, their forward guidance says 25 BPs in July, and then we may do more. Um, she, she could use the introductory statement to, to fine tune that a little bit and leaving the door open. So yes, it could be a market mover, especially with uh, the US of less liquidity, uh, we could see a little bit of uh, volatility around uh, her speech. That's yeah, right. uh, that's correct. As, as you say, usually these things in, in front of Parliament is just a, a rehash of what they said in their, their last meeting, which obviously last week. Um, and there's, there's, there is two appearances, but one of them is, is in a capacity as the ESRB chair. Um, so that's more on the regulatory side of things. Um, so she's not gonna she's not gonna say you know the same thing twice. Um, I.e., she's there. It's un, it's unlikely she's gonna say something uh, in the first bit that we don't get in the second bit, or you know surprising one but not the other. So um, yeah, there is a small risk there. I don't think there's gonna be there shouldn't be any any big risks there, um, or the market's gonna jump around. But it is a small risk, so so we'll keep an eye on that there as well. Um, just quickly before we move on, I saw. Uh, is it Andrew wanted a quick look at cable um it, I'm, I'm still in the same boat I'm, I'm pretty much not looking at cable to trade it at the moment it's you know good volatility but it's all over the shop in in, in my mind um there's there's no rhyme or reason for it the way it moves at the moment I just I just don't like it um I don't mind trading cable um but you know as I said last week you know, I think we were around 122. I said, could it just easily go back to 120 as it could go to 124? And <laughs> pretty much exactly what happened. Um, if, if you've got anything specific, Andrew, you want to, you know, ask about to do with cable, you know, what are you doing? Are you long? Are you short? Um, what are your views on it? You know, let us know in the, the comments there and we can get into it in uh, a bit more detail. Uh, 
but I'm gonna I'm gonna move on now um, to another subject. You know, might as well while while it's a bit quiet. You know, I've been in this I've been in this industry for a long time. On, on both sides of the fence, I've been in the institutional side. You know, obviously where I started my career in markets, and I've been on the, this this retail side. And to put it frankly, there's 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 a lot of bollocks in this industry. Um, there's a lot of glamorization. There's a lot of untruths, um, ridiculous claims about the the trading industry, the retail trading industry. Um, and what I hope to do with, with some of these shows is just to chew over some of those and go through those and dismiss some of the crap that you you may hear, um, because I think it's detrimental to trading. Um, there's a lot of showboating in this industry. Um, there's a lot of fake experts, people who, you know, you look at and you think, oh, yeah, they, they're great. They, they're interesting and, and they know what they're talking about. And, and some of them are just are just nobodies. I'm a nobody. You know, I've been in this industry a long time, but I'm a nobody. I'm 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 not a superstar or anything like that. I'm just a trader who tries to win more than he loses. What I have got is experience. I've got 30 years of doing this. Um, so I can speak with a bit of authority about what happens because I'm still in this industry after 30 years. Um, and I just, I just hate sometimes the type of people you get in this industry, you know, put on a suit and tie, have a little avatar, stick yourself on a website and all of a sudden you're an expert. So what I want to do with some of these shows over the, over the months and hopefully years ahead is, is just to, you know, knock out some of these, these lies. So we're going to, we're going to go through a couple of things, uh, today. Um, First things first, about trading as a whole, you need to treat this as a profession. It is a profession. Trading is a profession, okay? Trading is not putting your money into account and being able to push some buttons. That's not trading, okay? That is no more trading than me buying a pair of football boots and saying I'm a, I'm a, a Premier League footballer just because I can kick a ball, okay? There is... This industry is dedicated towards getting people to put their money into accounts and start trading with promises of, of riches. You know, it's easy. That's all you have to do. Stick a few hundred quid, a couple of grand in an account, bang, you're trading. OK, that's not how it works. That's not how any industry, any profession works. You know, you can't be a lawyer just because you read a few books. You can't be a doctor because you look at something on Google. You have to treat this like a profession. And that, and that doesn't matter whether you're trading part time full time just looking at it now and again you've got to treat it professionally and it's something that <clears throat> i know i struggled with moving from from the industry from inside the industry from the institutional side into the retail side i struggle with that because it's it's chalk and cheese it's completely different uh, uh, and i know Kay, Kay will admit this too and i know other ex-bankers um, some we've got in our room who struggle to make that switch because it is it is a completely different ball game. You may think you know everything about markets when you're on one side of the desk, but in, when you have to finally put finally put your money into trading, put your own money, make it your own living, and you get into a market and think, right, here I am, I'm putting my money in. Now I've got to decide whether that price is going up or down. A lot of a lot of what you thought you know goes out the window. I had my my retail moment. Um, when I went local on the life for that local is like trading your own money. <clears throat> and for all, all I knew beforehand about markets, when I stood there, my first day in the pit, and I remember it as if it was yesterday, my first day in the pit, I looked up that price board. I didn't know which way the price was going to go. And that's all I had to do. I had to put my money in. Is it going up? Is it going down? It can only go two ways. It's a 50, 50 bet. Is it going up or is it going down? And it was that point that I realized shit i i i know about markets but i don't know about what i need to do for for trading my own money taking the risks what if i'm wrong that sort of thing and it was a huge wake up call for me and from that point i had to do a lot of learning i had to learn about what the markets do how they function and things like that and it, it's the it's the same for you guys and girls. You know, you can you can read websites, you can follow gurus on on Twitter, whatever you want to do, and they all make it look easy. But I bet you, for for ninety percent of you who sit in front of your screen every single day, you don't know whether the next pip is up or down. And that is a is a big thing 
that's what you guys and girls, what we all have to get over and why we need to learn that this is a profession and learn how to trade, learn how markets move. Because until you get that, you're fighting with one hand behind your back. Um, and I think that's, that's, that is one of the biggest things in, in the retail space is that people don't tell you that. They don't tell you it's a profession. They just tell you it's easy. Okay, you know, I mentioned, you know, you and I know some of the other guys in the room. Um, you know, we had conversations when we first met, I remember, um, I think it was a, a trade show in London, um, mm -hmm. FX trade show where we first met. Yeah. Um, and I know you had the similar experience where you found the transition from, from institution to retail difficult because you, you what you knew didn't really help with, with trading retail. How, how do you think you've come along since? Um, well, I think I've, uh, to me, it was like, uh, like falling into a black hole. Um, I came from uh, dealing rooms, some of them like big ones where you have like uh, 700 or 800 people sitting next to you. And my biggest, uh, my biggest black hole was um, not to have any information flowing around my ears constantly and uh, having to go and look for it myself and finding out that um, when you sit in an institution, all of that is in, in, uh, in between brackets paid for to start with because you, you, can, you can rely on Reuters, Bloomberg, not only for the news headlines, but to do like masses of research if you want, uh, look at statistics, look at numbers, look at comparisons. And when you when you start at home, all of a sudden you don't have anything about it anymore, of all of that anymore, and then you have to start to to look for it yourself. Um, and in surplus, you don't have all your colleagues around you uh, um, giving you information for free that you don't uh, have anymore once you once you sit at home on your own. Uh, and that's why some of those like. Right, right now, Forex Analytics, Forex Flow, when we uh, Forex, um, yeah, Forex Flow, when we started, was so important is to to get at least a, a partial buzz around my ears again, uh, or, or being able to read about it. And yeah, as you say, we have to um, we have to uh, learn how to trade our own money. So I must say, from the trading side, the first six months were relatively easy for me because I knew exactly what my clients were doing, what the most important clients were thinking, what the most important thinkers in the market were thinking. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and then for the first months, it was like easy because all those things were resonating in my mind and in, and in my brain and it made my trading easy. But then all of a sudden, after six months, my, my performance were, was starting to go really, really lower. So I had to compensate with a lot of other stuff. So I'm it's really like a job. Um, I'm reading a lot. I'm uh, fooling around uh, more and more with uh, with with techs, uh, te technical analysis. Although I try to keep things relatively simple, um, but yeah, we have to to basically relearn how to how to trade for ourselves and 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 how to handle uh, the difference in uh, in 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 amounts and in volume. Um, when I when I started trading, I was trading uh, perhaps I don't know ten or fifteen or twenty or, or some some days more when I when I felt like it times per day. But then after a while, I started to feel I started to 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 see that I started to over trade because the less I knew, the more I wanted to trade, and so I had to 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 basically start all over again and um, go back to the basics. Uh, well, the the fundamentals weren't changing, so I could still, uh, I could still, uh, um, how shall I say, I fall back on my uh, on my experience that I uh, that I built up over the years in banks. But all the rest, like uh, handling my own money, trading, uh, getting my entry levels much more right than I had to do when I was in a when I was in a bank, because some of the clients they just give you your uh, your your entry levels, whether you make or lose money on it. Yeah. <laughs> but they tell you where they are interested. Uh, when you're on your own, you you don't see those flows anymore, right? And then uh, you have to yeah. you have to really rebuild yourself from scratch. And I can say that after uh, after uh, yeah, let's call it the first six months was really great. Then I had three months of four or five months even of uh, big 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 struggle. 
um, nearly blew up my account uh, over trading. But then, you know, I'm, as the experience and, and as I was like rethinking the whole thing, everything started to go better again. And now I can say that I uh, that I got uh, I got what it is. I, I understood what it is to be to be a trader at home. Uh, really, it's a great uh, a community as well. We are in, in in forex analytics now, because a lot of traders there talk a lot of sense and a lot of good levels and a lot of uh, uh, good ideas are, are flowing around. And I I hope that I can add a, a little bit of my own experience and 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 about fundamentals. But I think I I understood. Yeah, but it took me it took me. Uh, even though I had all this experience, I think it took me a year and a half of struggles to 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 get it all under control again, as well to as to see the light. light. Yeah. yeah, to see the light, sort of thing. I, what, I don't know if he's still about. Stell, you're you're about. You've you've made I the am switch. About. Yeah, I, I was going to say. I don't know if you've seen. Of, I, I did an interview for um, years ago. Drink Forex, it's called. Anyway, they've interviewed Blake. They interviewed me, and I I said pretty much the same stuff that uh, Cayman was saying. Uh, you know, I spent ten years being a market maker, um, trading um, derivatives and and pretty big size. You know, anything less than you know. 500 million, I wouldn't even care. I'd tell the salesman, price it yourself, tell me if I'm done. So um, going from that uh, to trading for my own, it was, uh, it was a bit of a shock. It took me about a year to get used to the uh, the lack of uh, information. I mean, that was that was a killer, the lack of information yeah. flow. And like yeah. you very correctly said, Cam, and knowing what your clients, what your sophisticated clients are doing um, was incredible. You know, I, I, I will never forget when the ECB was doing the LTROs, the one-year LTROs at the beginning, um, and after some months, uh, the phone rang and uh, it was like the, the head of a very, very big hedge fund, you know, very well-known name. And he goes, uh, what do you think, guys, will happen if the ECB does a two-year LTRO, LTRO? And we're like, okay, why would he be asking that? And, you know, five days later, they announce it. So, you know, you, yeah, it's, it's information that you get either directly or indirectly that you absolutely need. And uh, it is a very different ball game. And it's also a very different ball game trading for your own because you don't have the... Um, uh, the uh, the security, let's say, of having client flows um, effectively, you know, building a little bit of your PNL every day. So you know, we mm. would get some really nice juicy flows where they would say, you know, where do you offer two year swaps? You know, fifteen, and the guy goes, okay, you're done at twenty five, you know, and <laughs> so you are, uh, you know, you get some nice PNL that you can play with, and then you use that uh, to take your own. Um, you know your own views and and stuff, but uh, yeah, it is a very very different ball game, man. Really oh, yeah. different, different. It's 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 learning also how to lose money. Still, oh, absolutely. I mean, when when we lost money, sometimes when when I was making a price to one of the big hedge funds in three or four or five hundred million dollar yen, and as soon as he gave me, he he, he went like 15, 20 points lower. And uh, because he was giving somebody else as well. He, oh yeah, of course. He, he, you. Okay, you knew you knew that that could happen, but you can't imagine this to happen when when you're sitting at at home. You need to learn how to handle losses differently when when you work yeah. for your own. You you have to yeah. you, you have to build a, a complete different mentality for when you're wrong compared to when you sit in a bank and you say like, oh, right, I mean, part part of the market. You some some you win some some you 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 will get around your uh, around your neck. But uh when you're sitting at home you you don't want that to happen too often, right? Yeah, and the, the difference is when you're trading in, in on the institutional side, for apart from you know the effect on potential bonuses and stuff, it's not your money. It's the bank's money. You know, there's know. no there's no fairness. But what you know that's that's a whole other subject that uh we can save for another time, you know, how, how the difference between Okay. Trading in an institution and, and trading retail, um, you know. But the you know, so you've got this thing where where traders need to learn that this is a profession, and and obviously one of the big areas they can learn, and and something we we we're very hot on because this is how we trade with fundamentals, um, is learning what what the drivers are. Now I, we had a comment last Friday from from one of our viewers. You know, can we give a a lesson on you know, how to trade fundamentals and, and things like that, websites to look at, so on and so forth. I know I know we touched upon it a couple of weeks ago. You don't have you don't have to be 
educated to understand fundamentals. Um, there's probably three key things you need to understand about a country so you can understand about a currency. Um, it's what the economy is doing, uh, what the central banking is doing, um, and what, what it, something like inflation is doing. You know, three simple things because that's, you look at a central bank, they have a mandate. The mandate can be different, but it's usually around about the same thing. It involves inflation, it involves the economy. You know, the Fed has got a dual mandate. It's not GDP, it's not keeping the stock market afloat, it's full employment and stable prices. Okay, the ECB's mandate is to keep prices stable um, at or below 2%. Um, the Bank of Canada, they've got a, ma uh, a mandate, keep inflation within a 1% to 3% band. The mandate's always usually the same, but it gives you a, a basis of, of, of what a central bank is working towards. And then you can look at the data. What is the data doing? Um, now, with regards to resources, you know, in this age of technology, it should be pretty easy. Um, you want to find out what, what the Fed is doing, you go onto the Fed page and look up monetary policy. Here you can see all their last meetings. You can read up simple stuff you can see. You can see how they evolve. You know, if you go back and look over the statements, um, you can put them in, you know, compare them side by side in a text comparison site or something. But you can see how policy evolves, what they're looking at, the key things that they always look at um, and react to. So that gives you an idea of what what the central bank wants to do. And if you want to look at, at something like the, the fundamentals, a, a broad overview, this is a great site, Trading Economics. Um, you know, it gives a very, it can give you very detailed information or it can give you just the, the broad thing. So just on their homepage, it gives you, you know, a load of the major com uh, countries, what GDP is, what inflation is, what their, their interest rate is, jobless, budgets, debt to GDP, population, even things like that. And from there, you know, you can dial down as much as you want. Um, you can go into some of the data, pick your indicators um you know and you you can you can look you can find out exactly you know what is inflation doing is inflation rising is inflation falling um how is the central bank reacting to that um and you know you can click in you can get an idea you know inflation's rising in japan you know a similar position to what we're seeing elsewhere pick your country pick your time frame and so you can build up the fundamental picture because it's it's the fundamentals that mainly drive 90% of, of direction in markets and assets, and in this case, currencies. Um, it's what what the market sees these central banks doing, the economy doing. Um, now, from there, you have to you have to you have to judge what what time period you're in. Are we in a period of expectation, like six eight months ago? Um, the market was in a period of expecting what the Fed might do or what the Fed will have to be do. And that was a big driver uh, uh, of the dollar, a big driver in something like dollar yen. And then you have to know, right, well, when, when does that period of expectation end? Well, the period of expectation ends when the central bank actually acts. Usually that's the time when that big expectation trade, the big trend will start to falter because now the market has been trading what it expects. Now it starts trading what the central bank is actually going to do. Um, you know, I thought that, that maybe up at the, the 125s will probably be, would be considered a, a potential top for dollar yen um, back when we came through the, the last few months. But since then, it's rocked on up another thousand pips. Um, was it all beyond the Fed? Yeah, a lot of it was on the Fed because then they went further than the market expected, but also on the Bank of Japan, not doing what the market was expecting, staying on their path. It created the divergence between the, the two countries. So the fundamentals, while they may sound really complex uh, to understand, because you know you can go right down the rabbit hole. Um, you can look at you know and we we call them propeller heads who really get stuck into the you know budget deficits and trade balances and all that sort of thing. And and you know they start going into threads that even I get my eyes glazing over. Um, you know, tempo sin because it's just like, well, you, you're bamboozling me with all this economic information. All I want to know is do I buy it or sell it? Um, so you've got to keep yourself to the to the basics first if you don't understand fundamentals. Just learn the, 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 the ropes, the very basic stuff, what potentially is going to move a price one way or the other. And then, 
you need to switch, come in with the technicals. Um, now, I'm sure I'm not preaching to the choir here to tell you that there is not one signal, one single technical indicator that will ever tell you where a price is going to go. Uh, you may get things that tell you this may be a measured move and, and things like fib extensions, things like that. But to date, there has never been one indicator that will tell you a price is going to go up or down in the next minute, day, week, month, whatever. And purely talking from my own perspective, I started off when I, when I started uh, trading back full time in 2010, I was lobbying colored lines and indicators on my charts for love, no money. My charts were looking like they still do a bit. My charts were looking like the London underground map. Um, and it was that hunt for what's going to tell me where the price is going to go. But that's the wrong way to look at what technical analysis is, is for technical analysis. Um, is mainly self-fulfilling, okay? The reason why a moving average works or a FIB level works is because of the weight of people watching it, okay? Now, if you had to scale in the, the, the most popular technical indicators, you could probably use that as a scale for how likely it is to react as a level, okay? Now, things like moving averages, you know, the whole world looks at moving averages. They look at FIBs, they look at trend lines, they look at horizontal lines. Um, so, you know, if you've got some really complex technical indicator, you've got to think, well, how many people are going to be watching that? And if there's not a lot of people watching that, how many people are actually going to be trading that? Because the reason your technical indicators work is because of weight of numbers. So many people are looking at that. So many people are trading ahead into that, that level. By sheer force of power, that's the reason why that level may work. And they don't always work um, because, as we know, the retail money is still far lower than uh, what the institutional level of, of money and flows are. So if you find that you're using too many technical indicators because you're trying, you're trying to find out where the price is going to go, you're, you're doing it wrong. You need to scale back, come back to, to the start, look at things that work, start with little and work your way up. I mean, I see people, you know, They've got every technical indicator they like on screen. They're one minute looking at cup and handles, one minute looking at uh, uh, head and shoulders. The next minute is this, the next minute is that. If you've got to fit technicals into your trading to justify trading, you, you're coming at it from the wrong angle and you need to switch it around. And so what I would suggest to people is you build up your stable of tech. Stick with the, the start off with the, the most popular stuff. Simple things, fibs, moving averages. Trend lines. I can I can trade without a single technical indicator on my chart if I wanted to, just by looking at a 15 minute chart, looking at the price action. Let's pick something that maybe I haven't got anything uh, any lines on. Okay, so here's a here's a chart of the Turkish lira. 15 minute chart. Let's put it onto that. Okay, probably not the, the wisest choice, but okay, we'll go for it. So what can I see on that chart? OK, forget the moving averages. I can see there's some old resistance there. I can see there's some, there's some support there. Let's get a couple of lines on it just for, for visual purposes. So wallop and wallop. Oh, come on. So from that, I can start trading if I wanted to. I've got a resistance area that was there. A support area is there. The resistance area is broken. Okay, so is it going to become a support area? Yes, no, yes, no, bit messy. But what can I tell from this support area? Well, it's a support area until it's not. So until that breaks, there's a technical level I can trade. Okay, take the simple stuff first, then build your way up. But we re remember that they don't tell you what the price is going to do, and they are self fulfilling in, in essence. Um, so, as I say, if you have too many technical indicators on your chart, if you're finding that you need to use text to justify a trade rather than the other way around, um, you know, you need to reassess what, what you're doing. OK, you got any uh, thoughts on uh, your text? I know I know you use, uh, you know, use all the basics and I've seen over the over the months and years we've known each other that you've expanded your your stable of text as well how, how do you view things like that yeah i i found uh, 
some of them are interesting, more interesting than others. And and I, as I already said, like I'm I'm using it. Perhaps they will show on my on on some of my 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 charts because I've I really I, I try to to keep it simple. So all my uh, all my technical indicators would be roughly the same, uh, basically on the, on all my charts. But some of them are more interesting in uh, in. In different assets or uh, asset classes than uh, than in others. In FX, I'm really trying to keep it relatively simple to uh, FIBs and uh, and uh, uh, support resistance lines, and I can uh, occasionally throw a head and shoulder or so in there. Not really to not really to really plan a target for a trade, but to see where. Uh, because I know a lot of people look at it to see where it is it is possible uh, to accelerate. Like for instance, when the neckline breaks, it, it's possible that there is an acceleration. Or if it holds, it's it's um, it's uh, strengthening the level. Um, but then, for instance, moving averages, I'm uh, I'm I'm more using it for um, stuff like um, uh, equities and. Uh, and gold and silver, because I know the markets over there, they, they look more at those uh, at those things. But I'm trying to keep it down to a very select and very a small number of uh, indicators. As people can see from uh, my charts, same as Ryan, I, I don't have those indicators on the bottom, like uh, uh, RSI or um, stuff. I, I, I really don't like them because I think it's... Uh, they they are just there for the visual effect, and it's not because an RSI is at 80 that your that your pair is going to go down. Uh, it can go up to 85, and 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 the pair shoot another two figures. We have seen it on on the dollar yen, for instance, or on any yen pair. They were uh, theoretically overbought, but they stayed overbought for the next uh, seven eight hundred points. So yeah, and and yeah, and, and that's an important thing. You know, I don't want to come across like I'm dissing different technical indicators that's that's not what i'm saying what what people do is they find what works for them and if you trade cup and handles all day long and you make money from it fantastic hats off to you that's what that's what works for you then great and that's what you need to do you need to find what works for you you know i hate head and shoulders to me it's the biggest witchcraft in going but other people trade it and they trade it successfully um we all have different approaches and you've got to find what works but you need to start with the basics and build your build your way up. Um, now I am I do know that time's ticking on. We've been cracking on for an hour, um, so I just want to add, add one last thing to to the, the chat here that we're we're talking about. And again, this is something I hear in the industry a lot, and something I think is is complete horseshit. Um, you hear people saying that you know you, you haven't made it unless you've blown up an account. You haven't lost money. Uh, that that to me is is bullshit. You know, losing is not a rite of passage, okay? It's not something to boast about, okay? It's a badge of failure, not a badge of honour. I don't like losing, okay? I've only ever lost one account in all my years trading, uh, and that was because the broker went bust over the SMB. That's the only account I've ever lost. But I'm not saying I haven't lost money. Um, you know, that's part and parcel of the trading, but I've never blown up an account due to going bust um and it's it's again it's another one of these things oh yeah it's okay to lose money it's okay to blow up an account yeah i've blown up two accounts i've blown up three accounts it's all part of the process bullshit it's not part of the process the process is not losing money that's the first part of the process not losing money it's not making money it's not losing money and so use the system to your advantage you know particularly this this works what i do um it's a protection against things like blo brokers blowing up. Use the leverage in your favor. Okay, if you've got leverage and it's a bit tougher these days because they brought leverage levels down, don't put all your money into a into a broker's account. Um, you know, if you've got five, 10, 15, 20 grand to play with, don't put it all in. Just put in what you need to trade. So if you're trading, you know, between half and 1% and risk every time you trade, just put in enough to cover your margin plus a bit more on top for those for those moments you don't need to put in all your all your money use the broker's money okay because if something happens if there's a black swan event the broker goes bust or whatever you're you're trading a lot a bit of their money let them come and get it off you rather than you've lost all your money and you've got to get it back off them 
But losing is 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 not a good thing. So if you sit there thinking, oh, I don't, I don't care, I've, I've lost that, fine, that's that's part of it. You're not taking this seriously. You don't want to be losing. We're not here to lose. We're here to win. And just take that into your into your mindset. Keep it in with your discipline and and put it in with everything else that you learn. Learn this as a profession, as I said at the start. And then, you know, you can go on and make a success of it. Um, and it's hard. It's difficult. It's not easy. It's constantly learning. We're still learning. I'm still learning after 30 years every single day. The same as Kay, same as Stell, Blake, you name it. We're all learning every day. You don't stop learning. And as long as you've got that mentality to keep learning, you know, you'll be a success. And, and when you have the hard times, learn how to deal with it. Um, that sort of thing we, we can talk about. Another one, as I say, I know we've been uh, waffling on for a long while. Please, if you do struggle with any part of your trading and you want help, um, you know, have a look at our chat rooms. Come into the Forex Energy chat rooms. You know, we're in there every day. And we're there to talk to you guys and girls every day. Conversations like this, we can have every day. Um, it's down to you to seek that help, seek that learning, uh, and seek it off the right people as well. You know, the Blakes, the Stells, the K-Mans. Get it on from the right people, you know, not the, the fakers that are in this industry. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a solid one for a Monday, I think. Good chat and good to speak to you guys and girls. If you do have any topics you want to talk about, throw them at us. Let us know. You can come on the contact page, come in the room, Twitter, you name it. Come and ask us. Come and put it in the, in the talk here and uh, we'll get talking about it. As for that, thank you very much, Kay. Thank you, Stel. Um, thank, thank you, boys and girls. Have, have a great week. week's trading and we shall see you tomorrow. Have a great week. Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.